This video is sponsored by Sakurako and Tokyotreat. With the recent livestream for the next patch, I can assume you've already heard of the upcoming Iridori Festival, with our different characters getting a chance to meet one another and also visit the beautiful landscapes of Inazuma. By the time it gets released, the month of April is just a couple days away. However, did you know that in Japan, the month of April comes with warmer weather and is also where most sakura trees bloom the most, which make this a fantastic month to be in there. Unlike Kli, Venti, Xingqiu, and Albedo, there is no Ayato in real life that can invite me to see the beautiful landscapes of Japan. So as an alternative, I can just order a tasty snack box of both Sakurako and Tokyo Treat to experience both the traditional and modern life in Japan. With these, I can be able to taste the snacks and foods from the comforts of my own home. Tokyo Treat is a monthly Japanese subscription box full of popular Japanese candy and snacks, such as Japan-exclusive KitKat, Ramune, Ramen, and many more. As for Sakurako, it is also a monthly Japanese subscription box, but it is full of authentic and traditional Japanese snacks from Japan's local artisan snack makers. Both are delivered straight from Japan to your door. Tokyo Treats and Sakurako's boxes come with a different theme every month, keeping things exciting and fresh. If you want to experience these Japanese traditional and modern snacks, you can subscribe and use our code CLEMEN with 5% off on your first purchase. Now, if you're wondering how these snacks taste, I'll be trying them out myself. I've actually tried the Sakurako last month, and I had a chance to try their green sea cookies and salty but unusually delicious sanbei. There were also a bunch of Sakura-flavored bread and crackers. It was worth the price, especially if you love Japanese culture. Both of these products have a similar goal, which is to share Japanese culture to the world through the medium of snacking. If you want to enjoy pop Japanese snacks, you can choose Tokyo Treat. But if you want traditional Japanese treats, you can enjoy Sakurako instead. We're happy that these products decided to partner with us for this video. This is the April 2022 Sakura Festival, which is also called in Japan as Hanami. With that said, we will now be trying them out. Okay, so the first one I chose was the Sakura Daifuku where a daifuku is a small round mochi stuffed with a sweet filling, most commonly anko. The texture of this snack caught me off guard because it was silky smooth and was very fluffy. To be honest, it reminded me of the mochi snacks I used to buy back when I was a kid, but this definitely felt and tasted more authentic than the ones I had back then. The flavor of the anko bean paste stuffed inside was very sweet and it blended with the overall flavor. Now this next snack is called the Sakura Wafer. Much like the common wafers we have, this one has a unique taste where its cream is Sakura flavored. I like the cute designs they made for the wafers. It's actually cool that they added two with different designs. I don't know why, but I chose the heart because it's more cute than the other. The sweetness level was right enough for my liking. As for this next one, let's also try some snacks from Tokyo Treat. Not gonna lie, I immediately wanted to try the peach-flavored Kit Kats because where I live, Kit Kat is a very famous chocolate brand and a lot of people here want to get a taste of it. The peaches blended well with the chocolate flavor and I particularly liked it because it wasn't too sweet. This was definitely my favorite snack from the Taco Treat box. Now the last snack I wanted to show is the shrimp tempura soba noodles. Soba are thin Japanese noodles made from buckwheat flour. And there's a belief in Japan that eating them will give you a long life. We have a very similar belief like this in our country, which is why eating this snack for me was very familiar. There's some shrimp toppings which tasted really good with the mackerel flavor. I definitely recommend that you try this snack and get to try a different taste of noodles. All in all, I really enjoyed the snacks from both products, as it had a mix of sweets and traditional flavors. This just goes to prove that the snacks you get when ordering a Sakurako and Sake Treat will be worth it, as they are sourced from Japanese local snack makers, and will give you the best Japanese snack tasting experience at the comforts of your own home. So what are you waiting for? Click the link down below and enter our code CLEMEN for 5% discount. And join me as we eat these tasty snacks while we find out more about Enkinomiya's lore. Now let's get on with the video. In the last chapter, we got a glimpse of what Tevat looked like and how it was under the rule of dragons before the Primordial One came and was said to have reshaped the world. 
Now in this part 2, let us start off with a question. What would you do in a world that the sun cannot reach? A place covered with darkness? What would you feel if you suddenly heard unfamiliar roars echo towards you? Whatever answer you have, it all points to one common thing, fear. This is the fear that the first people of Enkonomiya experienced when they fell to the Aphotic Earth. What is the Aphotic Earth? I forgot to mention in the first video that the place we now call as Enkonomiya had different names in the past. For instance, the book titled Hydrological Studies in Yakoya Koku was said to have its title constantly edited, redacted, and modified over the years. It was there that the term Aphotic Earth was mentioned, and it was the title's name before it was changed. The term Aphotic is of Greek origin, that means without light, and reading from its description, it is a portion of a lake or ocean where there is little or no sunlight. So from this, we could conclude that when the first Ankonomians fell here, they called this place the Aphotic Earth. As time passed, they changed it to Tokoyokoku for reasons unknown. If we translate it, Tokoyokoku means a country of perpetual night. Then when the Dainichi Mikoshi was built, a tower that stands at the very center of the region, the name was then changed to Byakoyokoku, or Land of the Midnight Sun. It can also be translated as the Land of the White Night. Then when Orobashi arrived, it was then changed to Ankonomiya. I hope that clears up some confusion regarding the different names. Now going back to the main topic, the first Enkonomians defended themselves against the Dragoners for an unknown amount of time. They tried to escape the place by looking for pathways, but they didn't find any and were convinced that they were trapped below. They tried calling out for the Primordial One and the three other shades for help, but there was no response. However, the only one that did help them was Isdoroth, who I explained in the first video. Because of Isdoroth's guidance and knowledge, a sage known as Abrax had an idea to build an artificial sun that he named as Helios, which was contained in a tower or building called the Hyperion. This artificial sun would provide light so strong that could scare away the dragoners who feared light and could conveniently function as a day and night cycle in Enkonomiya. Because of the construction of the Helios, Abrax was recognized as a deity for his efforts and treated as a hero where statues were erected of him. The Enkonomians were able to rebuild under the Helios light and managed to form a functioning society again. It is here that they changed the name of Tokoyokoku to Byakoyokoku. Under the light of the Helios, the people experienced peace and started to have some semblance of having a normal world like in their old one. However, Abrax built this so that the people would continue to yearn for the light of the natural sun in their old world and not forget to find ways to return. Unfortunately, this wasn't the case because in their comfort, some people of Enkonomiya began to get greedy and power hungry. A faction of corrupt elders were formed and hatched a plan to ensure their absolute dominion over the people. They convinced the nation that the Helios was actually a god and not just the creation of Abrax. These corrupt elders would also establish a puppet leader called a Phython or a Sunchild who would serve as figureheads. What is a Phython? In Greek mythology, Phython is the son of the sun god Helios and the Oceanid named Clemene or Rhod. While these are the same names used in game, a Phython was instead a young child who was chosen by the corrupt elders. As kids, they were completely unfit to actually rule a nation and were easy to manipulate. Thus, they provided a convenient scapegoat for pretty much anything that went wrong. When a sun child is appointed, they are given a divine brittle that serves as a symbol of the rule to the people. It's similar to a crown given to a lord or a king. However, in this case, why is it a brittle? Well, it is because in Greek mythology, the god Helios is said to have a chariot that rides the sky as the personification of our sun. As you may know, a chariot uses horses to serve as its movement, and a bridle is put onto these horses for the charioteer to control their direction. In the case of Enkonomiya, the divine bridle is an indication of how the sun children are just like horses being controlled by the charioteers or the corrupt elders. The first sun child was named Rikoru and he idolized Abrax for his construction of the artificial sun. If we read his tombstone at this location, 
It mentioned here about his fondness for building, and also details his creation of a miniature version of the Helios as a tribute to his idol. Now, this idea of appointing children to act as puppet leaders and worshipping the Helios as a god angered Abrax. But when he expressed his opposition to the elders in the first sunchild, Rikoru, Abrax was accused of treason and was imprisoned under the Helios. The elders had manipulated Rikoru into thinking that Abrax wanted to steal his throne and kill him, thus why Abrax was detained for the rest of his life. However, what happens if Rikoru grows up? Won't he be aware that he was deceived by the elders at his side? Well, to put it in a subtle way, no sunchild ever grew up, because when they reach a certain age, they are sacrificed to the Helios, or the Dainichi Mikoshi that we call today. The corrupt elders created a ceremony known as the Rite of Solar Return, where at the Sun Child's final days, they are taken in the inner sanctum, and were then burned to literal ashes by the extreme temperatures of the artificial sun. After which, a new Sun Child was appointed, and the cycle continued for an estimation of 70 years, because there were a total of 7 Sun Children that ruled. If you're curious to find them in the game, I've provided a map view of it to serve as your guide. You can actually converse with them, and they will also share some dialogues. To summarize, these seven Sun Children have different unique traits, and each of them shares some info about themselves. Now, I already mentioned Rikoro and his story, but to expound on his Greek origin, his name was likely derived from Lycoros, where in Greek mythology, is one of the sons of Apollo. To add to that, the names of the next Sun Children I will summarize were also derived from the sons of Apollo, such as Eon from Eon, Pyramumon from Philemon, Serapio from Asclepius, Risotaisu from Aristeus, Oropeosu from Orpheus, and lastly, Isumenasu from Ismenus. For the next Sun Child, Eon, he was said to be versed in fortune telling and sigil signs. While he claims he never missed a read on someone's future, he still often predicts wrongly. The next one is Piramumon. I noticed that some players seem to connect him with Paimon, mainly because of their nearly similar names. However, as I mentioned before, Piramumon was derived from Philemon, a son of Apollo. In-game, Piramumon managed to read some ancient texts that talked about a time before Ankinomiya dropped below. Because of this, he soon dreamt of exploring those lands and sharing his adventures. Unfortunately, before he could achieve such dreams, he was burned in the rite of Solar Return. The saddest thing is that he had hoped to sneak out of the Dainichi Mikoshi once the ceremony ends. He never realized that it would be his final day as a sun child. The next one, Surepio, was a sun child who got ill in his early childhood and was said to gain knowledge about the art of medicine. If you speak to him, you will notice that his illness wasn't completely cured and is still reminded to take long good rests. It's just sad that he hadn't had the opportunity to grow up and become a physician. As for Risotaisu, he loves to create clay statues of his servants. If you also talk to him, he mentions that he gets bored from meetings and reading pre-written material by those adults. This is actually more proof of how the faction of corrupt adults completely controls the actions of the Sun Children. The last two are Isumenasu and Oropiasu. Isumenasu was a Sun Child whose hobby was taking trips on a boat. If we talk to him, he was first astonished by the idea that there are more lands beyond Ankonomiya. As for Oropeosu, he was said to be well versed in playing the lyre and having a lovely voice. He sang songs about the inevitable fate of separation and promised to Klimene, a female official in charge of taking care of the Sun Children's daily lives, that he would not sing again until he hears her voice. Klimene herself, as a sinshade, regrets not taking action and would instead follow the instructions of the nobles and watch the children become more corrupt. In Greek mythology, Clemena is the mother of Phython. In this case, Clemena acts as the mother of the Sun Children. Now, I know what you're thinking, that the Sun Children has servants or bodyguards who are in charge of managing their daily lives such as Clemena. So, why won't they instead tell the Sun Children that they are being manipulated? Well, the Elders knew this could happen, and so they made sure that the Sun Child would never be able to get any help or support as a leader as their personal bodyguards were forbidden from talking to them and were only given a limited time to visit. Such is Clemena's case. Because her job was to take care of the Sun Children's daily lives, she was forbidden from marrying and having children, 
So as time passed, Clemena began to see the Sun Children as her own. However, despite wanting to let them know the truth, she was always under the supervision of the corrupt elders. This worked well, as the Sun Children's reign was hated across Enconomia, and only a few people knew that these Sun Children were being manipulated by the elders. With all of this talk of the Sun Children's reign, what then happened to Abrax? Did he ever get free from his imprisonment? Well, when he opposed the idea of treating his creation as a god, it was only the second year after the Helios was completed, noted by the title in the book as the second year of Sun and Moon. To answer the questions, it seems that Abrax never got his justice and died of old age in his prison cell, located underneath the Dainichi Mikoshi. After his death, his remains were scattered across Enkinomiya, specifically in the Narrows, the Evernight Temple, and the Serpent's Heart. His memories were also preserved by the Ley Lines and are the reason why he appears as a Sinshade and we could talk to him. Because of how the Elders and the first Sun Child, Rikoru, painted him as a traitor, some followers would vandalize the statues built for Abrax, thus why we encountered some incomplete figures in Enkinomiya. However, despite all these, Abrax did not blame the Sun Children for their tyranny. Instead, he put his hate on the corrupt nobles manipulating them. In one of his dialogues, he shares with us that he regrets his inability to save the Sun Children and Enkinomiya, and how sad he felt when they used his creation as a tool of deception. Quite a tragic ending for the Helios forger, Abrax. With the Sun Children's reign terrorizing the people of Enkinomiya, some took up their arms and decided to rebel against the tyrants, one of which was named Supada no Hiko, also known as Spartacus. In real history, Spartacus was a gladiator slave in the Roman Republic that rebelled and started the Third Servile War. While this war only happened for two years, the Roman Republic had lost a lot of their armies because of Spartacus' victories before finally being defeated by Crassus in 71 BCE. His original goal was to escape the Italian peninsula and finally settle in lands that were not controlled by the Romans. However, most of his troops wanted to stay and continue pillaging within the Roman territories. Because of this, his armies were soon overrun before finally being encircled by the armies of both Crassus and Pompey. In the case of Genshin Impact, the Spartacus we have in-game formed a secret group and attempted to oppose the elders that controlled the Sun Children. He was one of the few who was aware of the manipulation by the elders. His group used hit and run tactics and built hiding places where they could replenish their strength and continue to attack. Unfortunately, just like in real history, Spartacus and his group were defeated, but under different circumstances. There came a time when Spartacus and his group attacked the bodyguards of the Sun Child. He was captured and was imprisoned in the altar at the Serpent's Heart. From there, Spartacus was brutally tortured and his eyes were removed from his sockets. Because of this brutal torture, his sunshade was left in such a bad state that it was barely able to recall any of its memories, thus why we needed to remind him by going to his tombstone. While he was being tortured at the Serpent's Heart, some rebels managed to escape and retreated to their hiding places. One of the rebels, Adonis, told us that without Spartacus to guide them, the resistance would struggle to come back from this defeat. Because they badly needed funds for their weapons and supplies, one of the rebels suggested that they sell Dragonbone Orbs. What is a Dragonbone Orb? These are rare fruits from Dragonbone Flowers, where its fragrance is said to relax the mind and calm anxious thoughts, sweeping all of one's worries away. From its rarity, these fruits would sell for a very high price and could solve their funding problems. While it did provide the rebel group with a lot of funds, some rebels suddenly began to not continue the fight because of the effects of the Dragonbone Orbs. Because it was said to sweep all worries away, the idea of oppression was removed from the minds of the rebels. Gradually, most of the rebels disbanded and only a few remained, for instance, Adonis. Adonis expressed to us that he regrets their idea of selling the Dragonbone Orbs and could have prevented this if Spartacus had been around at that time. He also wonders if the one who suggested this idea was a spy of the corrupt elders who infiltrated the rebel group or maybe a traitor amidst their ranks. Suffice to say, Spartacus' rebellion wasn't a waste of effort and manpower. Instead, it led to the discovery of a new hero, wherein his remaining rebels would swear an oath and finally liberate Enkinomiya from the Sun Children's reign. 
Just like Abrax used his wisdom to save his people from the darkness, this hero from the ocean depths would soon lead them to the surface and give them a new home full of beautiful fauna and the lights of the natural sun. In the last video of this series, we will be giving an in-depth analysis of the three parables from the book, the Oathsworn Eyes lore, and some theories about the vassals and their origins. As of now, you may have already completed the limited events, the three realms to get a basic context for the next. But for those who would watch this in the future, I will provide a summary before I start the analysis. While we're waiting for the next video, you can check out our analyses on the Playable Fatui Harbingers, we're Clementine, and we will see you in the next.